Let's make a video about making ethyl acetate, C4H8O8, which is a nonpolar solvent. Some information about this, it's also known as ethyl ethanoate. Its formula is CH3COOCH2CH3, which this also represents obviously shortened. It smells sweet like nail polish remover because nowadays most nail polish removers are made of ethyl acetate. It was first made in 1759 by German chemist Andreas Margraff. He made it using ethanol, acetic acid, with sulfuric acid. Surprise, surprise, but it was a rather crude experiment. Nowadays, more refined, it's known as the classic Fischer esterification. Fischer esterification is named after Emil Fischer, who around 1895 laid out the mechanism, reversibility, and the details of this acid-catalyzed reaction. It's not heat-driven, although heat is involved in the beginning. It's only done to move the reaction forward. It's actually acid-catalyzed, which Margroff did not fully understand back when he did it. Ethyl acetate is used for nail polish remover, again, model glue, and it works as model glue because it actually melts the plastics together rather than just adhering them one to another. It works as a solvent and for extractions because all of the decaffeinated coffee that we drink today comes from using ethyl acetate to remove the caffeine. As a nonpolar solvent, it can be quite helpful to the amateur chemists for extractions of caffeine, which you can do on your own, tryptophan, nicotine, and there are quite a few others. Before I move on to the materials, etc., I got to say that I did not know how much room I'd need for this, and this actually ended up being really crammed in the bottom and pretty small, which I apologize. It kind of reminded me, quite honestly, of that. In our materials, we need 96% or plus ethanol, 60 milliliters, glacial acetic acid, 50 milliliters, and 98% sulfuric acid, 4 milliliters. To count as a Fischer esterification, you need an alcohol, which we're using ethanol, you need a carboxylic acid, we're using acetic acid, and you need an acid, and we're using sulfuric acid. Going over our reaction that shouldn't have an S there, I'm just going to go over this one right here, which is the main one, and that is the acetic acid right here, CH3COOH, plus our ethanol, CH3CH2OH, yields our ethyl acetate, CH3COOCH2CH3, this long one right here, and water. And that's another part of the Fischer esterification is it will also always yield the ester, which is this right here, and water. So if you look at this, it makes perfect sense what happened, although there's about seven steps really that have, have to happen for this to occur. You drop the um, H right here and the OH right here, which gives you the H2O, and then these two are bonded which gives you this, the ethyl acetate. You'll notice in this reaction equation that sulfuric acid is not in the equation, even though we're obviously going to be using it. And that's because I mentioned this earlier, this is an acid catalyzed reaction. So as such, the sulfuric acid is not consumed in the reaction and in, therefore it's not in the equation. But what the sulfuric acid does do, it protonates the oxygen on the acetic acid. It helps form the tetrahedral intermediate and it promotes the elimination of water to form the ester. And of course, it's regenerated at the end, which is what makes it a catalyst. And again, I co commented on a couple things here that they're not clearly shown. The reaction is rather complicated. It's beyond the scope of this particular video. But if you look it up, you can easily find it online uh, and follow the intermediate steps because there are quite a few. And you can see how this all plays out. On to the methods here. Again, I apologize. Everything is so tiny. But the first thing we're going to do is set up a reflux where we're going to take the uh, three items here and put them into a round bottom flask. I'll be using an oil bath here. Uh, it'll reflux for approximately two hours. The oil bath will be around 80 to 85 degrees Celsius, which should give us a good 77 degrees inside of here because that's the boiling point of ethyl acetate. And as this continues to run, the multiple reactions occur. After two hours, you'll have your ethyl acetate. You'll also have small amounts of the three original polar substances, the ethanol, glacial acetic acid, and sulfuric acid left in here. And the following steps are getting rid of all of those and the water. Just so you know, the actual reflux setup is a fractional distillation column here and then a regular distillation column here with cold water, which will prevent any of the vapors from escaping, even though the top will not be capped. After this refluxes for a couple hours, we're going to let it cool down and move it over to a separatory funnel. At that point, we're going to perform a series of washes. The first one will just be plain 100 milliliters of distilled water cold, which when we mix it through here and shake it, we'll start to draw out the little bits that weren't used in the reaction of the ethanol, acetic acid, and sulfuric acid, because again, these are all polar, so they will mix with the water. We'll drain that out. Then we'll do washes twice of 50 milliliters of a sodium bicarb solution, which is mainly meant to neutralize the sulfuric acid. When we're shaking this and mixing it, we'll need to vent this quite often because of the carbon dioxide that forms in here. If you don't, something will definitely pop. Once you're done doing that, 
twice with the 50 mils. We're then going to, and of course you're draining these each time, then we're going to put in 50 milliliters of a brine solution. And that's of course a saturated salt solution, which will help draw even more water out of this organic layer, which is the ethyl acetate. Once we're done with that, we'll drain that out. And then we'll finally drain the organic layer into another container, which will be a flask. Inside this flask, we'll have the anhydrous magnesium sulfate, which works really well for this experiment. You can use calcium chloride, but anhydrous magnesium sulfate works a little bit better. We're going to leave it in there for 30 minutes capped, hopefully absorbing most, if not all, of the last bits of water in there. Then we're going to pour the ethyl acetate into a round bottom flask and perform a regular fractional distillation. So it'll boil at 77 degrees like before. What it will leave behind in here are any of these things, the sodium bicarb or salt, or even some of the mag sulfate that might've snuck through. So those will get left behind, plus hopefully any water that might be left. And when we fractionally distill this, what we'll get over here is some really pretty pure ethyl acetate. Once we're done with this last distillation here, we wanna store it. And it's best to use glass, not plastic, because ethyl acetate can work on plastics over time and dissolve them. Uh, you want it to be kept well, of course, and in a cool, dry place. This is fine if you're going to use it pretty quickly. If you plan on using it for any extended periods of time, you can add BHT, which is a food preservative, or even iron sulfate. Both the anhydrous and the hydrous forms work just fine. You just, of course, add different amounts slightly. And those are added, plus the BHT, to prevent peroxides, which can form over time and are quite dangerous. Next time I hope to plan ahead a little better, but let's go make our ethyl acetate. Right in the middle of making my anhydrous magnesium sulfate, there's around 50 grams here and it's on a hot plate of course that reaches around 300 degrees Celsius. You can't go much above 400 Celsius without starting to destroy it, but this is perfect. Half hour later and it's done and this stuff is like a rock, like seriously very very hard i'm going to work on chipping that thing up and be back when i'm done took a little work but it's done i'm going to package this up now real quick so it stays anhydrous 60 milliliters of anhydrous ethanol pre-measured 50 milliliters of glacial acetic acid pre-measured 4 milliliters of 98 percent sulfuric acid pre-measured our very first order of business here is of course to mix our three ingredients i have this set up like this because I wanted to be able to use a magnetic stirrer here, especially for the sulfuric acid, because it can mix with some of the water and the ethanol, although there's not much, and it can create hot spots. So you want your sulfuric acid, which I'll be adding last, to mix as quickly and thoroughly as possible to prevent those hot spots. Also, there's no heat being applied here, so no esterification can occur really. I mean, if it does, it's at a very low rate. And because of that, you can pre-mix these and leave them up to 12 hours or overnight without a problem as long as you cap this to prevent any evaporation. Uh, so I'm gonna start the magnetic stir right here. First thing I'm gonna add is the ethanol. Next, the glacial acetic acid. And lastly, and a little slower, the sulfuric acid. And lastly, I'm going to cap this, not because I'm going to leave it overnight, but it, it will take me a bit to set up the uh, next step. And I do need the stand that I'm using currently here. So I'm going to cap it. I want to go over the setup real quick before we actually turn the heat on. As I mentioned, we're using an oil bath. And the oil bath, of course, is sitting on a hot plate right here. And it has mineral oil in it. It's hard to see, but it's there. This is the same round bottom flask that I, you just saw a minute ago. Uh, I just transferred it over here. There is a magnetic stirrer there, but it's sitting on the pan. It's not inside the round bottom flask. We don't need one there. It's just going to ensure that the oil moves around because the pan's a little bigger and keeps the uh, temperature as even as possible. We need that oil to be around 80 to 85 degrees Celsius to get the 77 degrees Celsius we'll need for the ethyl acetate to boil. Right now it's around 33 degrees Celsius. It's a little bit high because I was messing around with this just testing things out so the oil got a little bit heated but it's not nearly hot enough of course. Once the vapors are formed they're gonna hit this column called the Vigroux column which you've seen before. Basically most of them will not get through this column and they'll drip back down to keep the reflux going. If they do get past this they'll hit this column which is called a Liebig column a standard distillation column and that's going to have water running through it at 15 to 20 degrees celsius so with those cool temperatures no vapor should get out the top even though there's no cap you can't cap this because the gases would of course pop the thing right off so i do have the um, vacuum hood running there in the back you can see it uh, just in case some vapors do escape but i don't expect that to happen at all so i'm going to start this up here we're going to turn on the heat and the magnetic stirrer 
and of course we need to keep this running for two hours so I'll be back periodically to check on it. It's been running for t about 20 minutes right now. We're seeing the first signs of evaporation there but there's nothing up in the column yet so the clock does not start the two hours yet for the two hours until we start seeing things come up here and actually reflux back in there. The oil temperature is 84 and a half degrees Celsius. It's been 40 minutes and I just saw a couple drops come off those bottom prongs right there back in here so I am going to start the timer for the two hour reflux. The oil bath is at 85.3 degrees Celsius which is just perfect. It's been six or seven minutes since I last showed you this and it's boiling quite nicely there. Plus we're seeing multiple levels here with uh, dripping so the reflux is on real good. I just want to make a comment on the mineral oil. It is good up to 150 degrees Celsius so we're well within its safe limits of use. It's been an hour since this actually started to reflux. The vapors have made their way all the way to the top here. They haven't quite hit those top prongs yet. If they do, we've got that above to stop it. But another hour and we'll be done. Another hour is up and the reflux has been running really great all the way up to here. You can see at the bottom there it even started to go into the second column. So glad it was there but uh, it's time to turn this off. I do want to make one quick comment. I used an aluminum pan here because it was non-magnetic, but that uh, hot oil with the spinning magnetic stir has just ground up tons of small particles of aluminum, and you can see them swishing around in the oil there. So this will permanently be the oil I use for hot oil. Okay, time to turn this off. I have the separatory funnel set up here for the next series of washes to clean up our ethyl acetate. I took a minute to set this up so the ethyl acetate was actually put in the freezer for a bit here uh, while I did this and broke down the previous setup uh, so it's kind of chilly. The first wash is going to be cold water, 100 milliliters of it and I'm using cold water versus warm water because it prevents the hydrolysis of the ethyl acetate. If you use warmer water you can actually drive some of the reaction backwards of course you lose your ethyl acetate if that happens. Also cold water prevents the ethyl acetate from dissolving in it more. It already has a very low solubility but the warmer the water the more ethyl acetate will dissolve in it. So that's why we're using cold water. We're using water because we added three polar molecules uh, in liquids to make one non-polar molecule. So there's likely small amounts left of each of those and they're of course still polar. So water is polar. If we mix it in there, it will mix with the aqueous layer, those three things, and we'll come out with the water which is the polar uh, end of things. So we're going to do this. I'll first add the um, ethyl acetate so we can get started. All right, just adding the ethyl acetate. Now adding the cold water. Okay, done. The aqueous layer is forming on the bottom and I'll drain that next. Okay, removing the aqueous layer along with some of the sulfuric acid, some of the acetic acid, and some of the ethanol. All right, done. I'm now going to do two washes with a sodium bicarb solution, which I made with five grams of sodium bicarb and 50 milliliters of water. I'm only going to show you one because it would be boring otherwise. This, of course, is to remove most of the acid that's in there. But you can see bubbling. Okay, done. With the first one, I'll be back when I'm ready to do the sodium chloride solution. I just finished the second wash here with a sodium bicarb solution. I haven't drained it yet, but I had an unfortunate mishap. The separatory funnel came with this as a cap for the top, which usually works really great. Um, and so I was using this, but during the second wash, as I washed it, I noticed uh, a little bit of liquid on my left hand. And uh, eventually I noticed that it was leaking. The ethyl acetate was leaking out and onto the table. I'm guessing I lost 40 to 50% of the yield, unfortunately, which evaporated extremely quickly. So, well, at least I know it's ethyl acetate. I eventually switched over to a, a glass stopper here uh, and it worked fine. But, yep, that happens sometimes. I'm going to continue on as if we had all of it. I'm going to go ahead and drain this second batch of sodium bicarb solution. 
done. You can see there's a smaller volume, but we'll still do the salt solution next. And lastly, adding our brine or salt solution here. I basically made this by pouring salt into another container with distilled water until I could not dissolve any more salt. And then I poured the top 50 milliliters off of it. So here goes. I'm still gonna use the full amount. Done. Draining out the brine solution. Done. That right there is some precious stuff. I'm just going to drain the ethyl acetate into the original but clean 250 milliliter round bottom flask. So I'll cap that. Next we're going to do the uh, anhydrous magnesium sulfate wash. I've got two grams of anhydrous magnesium sulfate in there, which is plenty for the small amount of ethyl acetate we're working with. So I'm going to pour it in there, cap it, and swirl it around. Leave it for a good half hour to absorb as much water as possible. Every step is now trying to get rid of that water. No reason to show this anymore. I'll be back in a half hour. Half hour is up. I put a small quantity of cotton on the bottom of this funnel right here to collect any small bits of magnesium sulfate. If some do get through into the round bottom flask there, it's fine. Small quantities will not matter when we do the fractional distillation. You don't want a lot of magnesium sulfate in your uh, round bottom flask with the ethyl acetate as you do the distillation because it can actually break down uh, some of your ethyl acetate. The cotton's made of cellulose, so it won't be dissolved by the ethyl acetate. We only have one last step here, and that's to fractionally distill this, so I gotta set that up, be back. All set up for the distillation here. You will notice I don't have a fractional distillation tube, which I talked about quite a bit. The reason I'm doing that is because there's such a small quantity left here uh, of our product, and you will lose some of that in the tube itself, the fractional distillation tube, and I didn't want to do that, again, because there's so little. So I'm just setting up a regular distillation, but what this will do is leave behind any salt, sodium bicarb, or any magnesium sulfate that might be in there still and purify it. And on this end, I've chosen to use a very small 50 milliliter uh, round bottom flask because, quite honestly, it looked like we got more than we really did. Plus, I haven't used it yet. You'll also notice I'm not using the oil bath. For such a small quantity there, it was a lot to set up. So I'm just going to use this regular ring heater that I've used quite a bit. Plus, I do have this variable input so I can change the temperature as needed and keep it low. Again, we're looking for about 77 degrees for this to evaporate. So it's that time. Let's go ahead and turn this on. And I will be back when something actually starts to happen. We do have the temperature pretty low. In fact, those rings aren't even glowing. But we do have some nice boiling going on. The temperature is getting up there. If you can see that, it's around 60 degrees, but it's raising. And we'll top off right around 75 to 78. It's a little variable, but it'll get there. The temperature has reached 76 degrees, and we have a really nice boil going on there. And on this end, it's dripping really well. This will be our purified ethyl acetate. As this finishes up, you can definitely see some white solids on the bottom there, which could be any number of the things I mentioned earlier, but that's why you do this final distillation. It's hard to see here, but if you look at the very bottom there, it's, there's still some liquid, but it stopped boiling. Surprise, surprise, there was a little bit of water still left in there. This has finished dripping, so I'm going to remove it and I'll show you the final product. This is the very, very last step, and then we are absolutely done. So here's our purified ethyl acetate I have here three milligrams of ferrous sulfate, which I'm gonna to add to it to prevent uh, peroxide formation. So that comes up and then we're done. We're done. Here's the final product of ethyl acetate with peroxide inhibitor. You know, we lost quite a bit earlier. I did when I spilled it out of that separatory funnel, but the process was accurate. We ended up with a good product there. Just showing you where the ethyl acetate poured on too. You can see it went through the paper of the foam board fine, but ate out the foam quite nicely and left a divot. 